So this has been a great discussion. Um, one other thing I want to uh, tackle before we move on to uh, the agents we have available and maybe some in the pipeline. And that is the question of the AZA slash decidabine failure. Um, so, and let's try to define this as a patient who's clearly had a benefit um, to one of those agents with a hematologic response and then loses that response. Um, uh, I know, Elias, you, you and your group have published on how those patients do. Can you give us an update from that? How do those patients do? And then I would like to throw it up to the panel. What do you do for those patients? What is your next go-to therapy? Well, great question, and it's a real unmet need uh, today. We don't have any drug available once you fail Videsa or Decitabine. Uh, there's no drug approved. You can go for clinical trials or you can reverse them. You start with 5 uh, azacitabine, you fail, you go decitabine and vice versa. That's what's happening. So if you take patients who were treated and fail, let's say high-risk MDS patient, and they fail, the outcome is very poor. Median survival is only four months. We've reported, the French re reported the same, uh, same data, four months to six months survival. The trials are ongoing to address what we have. One of them uh, that we can discuss is the Regostartib trial in a setting of uh, hypometatic agent failure and the primary endpoint will be survival, obviously. If you make it, then you can get the drug. If you don't, then it's sad. I want to mention one thing here, and that brings me to AML a little bit. When they fail MDS and they go into acute myeloukemia, the outcome is very poor. And sometimes we treat them in an AML trial and the responses are really bad. So we really need something for these patients. If you fail MDS, high risk, go for clinical trials, refer your patient to academic setting. One. Second, for the low risk, we and Dramio, we've analyzed our data on 440, 438 patients with low risk MDS. What we've discovered actually, first one, uh, first element, is they don't transform into acute leukemia. Only 7% will go into AML. At the time of failure, the majority will remain into low risk categories, whether they use IPSS revised or MD Anson global scoring system or others. Two thirds remain low risk. Overall, the median survival is 17 months once you failed uh, this kind of therapy. Still, we don't have anything. Now, in that setting, bone marrow transplant was the best player in a way that like you get them, they fail this, this kind of therapy, they still don't have much disease to go into AML. You can save them with transplant. Still, we need clinical trials. So again, the message for the community doctors, if you failed, the cytabine or 5 aza please refer your patient to academic setting. We need this patient for clinical trials and hopefully we can improve their outcome. I totally echo all your comments. I think we know clearly now that AZA failure, whether it's lower risk or higher risk, is associated with poor outcome. Your data and the things we are doing together are suggestive of that. Uh, again, the ideal thing is clinical trial. Uh, for, for those patients. Uh, uh, a plug for the clinical trials is actually the data shown from the French group when they looked at those outpatient outcome after failing is a nucleoside and what treatments they got. The best outcome, as you mentioned, in our data as well was if they went to transplant, but the second one was actually investigational therapy rather than doing anything else. Uh, all the things we think sometimes gonna be helpful were, were really not helpful. So either transplant or a clinical trial were the most two helpful things to offer patients at this stage. There's some potential bias in that is that you're selecting patients that are fit enough to go to transplant or fit enough to enter a clinical trial, but I agree with you that the hope of the agents that remain available to you after that is not as, as great as those other options. Rafael, in a retrospective way, just we, because we thought of the bias, because if you can live a few months, you can get a trial. If you're sick enough, you, so we did the landmark as well after like a few months from the time of failure, and still, uh, treatment yeah. uh, did uh, come up as a significant uh, marker in a multivariate. I'm not surprised. So, so I think this is an important point, uh, and I completely agree. I don't think anyone on this panel would not recommend transplant or a clinical trial for, for patients who have clearly failed a hypomethylating agent. I, I think the message, though, has to be made even clearer because um, the people sitting on this panel are the same people who publish about the addition of lenalidomide to azacitin, decitabine, and how about varinostat and the HDAC inhibitors? How about clofarabine? I mean, there's published data. So are we saying that that data is not strong enough to move it into clinical practice, all commercially available drugs? I I'm really challenging you now. I mean, should the private clinician who has a patient uh, failing azacitin, decitabine, go to JCO or blood or leukemia, look up one of these papers and say, I'm going to try clofarabine if the third-party carrier would cover it. Yeah, well, I would say at this point, it's not clear that, that the standard of care, you know, there have been many, op, many combination studies that have been published, again, with, with commercially available agents. Yeah, but not, none of that data really has yet risen to, you know, being able to, to transform kind of a standard approach. 
Clearly, in each of those studies, there have been individuals that seem like they have benefited from a combination, you know, but it's not clear that one combination is, is superior to another. And, and I think a, a little bit it has been trial and error. I mean, I think that's why we are also desperate for a bit more guidance, you know, from some sort of surrogate marker, whether it be uh, a molecular biology or something else in terms of predicting, whether it be investigational plus currently available, so ASA plus some investigational, of which there are many competing trials, let's say, or ASA and some uh, commercially available drug. Well, I mean, the practical standpoint is a lot of community providers uh, have a patient that simply can't travel to an academic center, but uh, I think the thought of recommending sort of off-label whatever you find in, in blood or JCO is probably not the best guidance that I would offer, I would say, try everything you possibly can to get to a place that's doing these trials. And I think it's, and, and it makes it that much more important in terms of um, regulatory issues and uh, having patients being able to be treated look close to home but on clinical trials. And we have a lot of work right. to do here in the United States to, to make that happen because I am certain that that clinicians in the community would love to have their patients on a clinical trial, but there are these issues of so socioeconomic and demographic barriers that, that we all deal with. Well, I, I think we better move on.